Is past government experience indicative of future presidential success? Would you rather have a corrupt politician or a senile politician? And if parents had free choice in schools, how would they be able to tell which school was trustworthy? We tackle these questions and more on this episode of Good Take, Bad Take. Hey friends, welcome to this episode of Good Take, Bad Take. This is the show where we go through all of the posts we see on the internet and find the most interesting ones. We bring them here and we talk about what's good and what's bad. My name is Donald and I'm here with my co-host Britt. Before we get started, just a reminder to like and share and all that good stuff. Helps us out a ton. You can follow us uh, on our social platforms at Good Take, Bad Take Pod on Instagram and Good Bad Take Pod on Twitter and YouTube. Without further ado, we're going to move right in. So our first take uh, comes from Twitter and uh, Chris Freeman posts. Rawls' entire argument for socialism over capitalism falls apart when you realize that he, like many others, illicitly compares ideal socialism to non-ideal capitalism. Uh, what do you make of this uh, comparison of comparisons? It, it's really good. Um, this is a good good take on, on Rawls' argument. Um, I haven't read all of A Theory for Justice, um, but I've read parts of it, and I've obviously I've heard lots of people commentate on it and refer to it in various things. Um, and I, I browsed a little bit of of, of uh, what I think Chris Freeman is alluding to, which is in a theory of justice, like Rawls lays out like the moral, fr- the appropriate way to have a moral framework for the type of society you want is to use a veil of ignorance to um, basically someone that it has no clue of what uh, uh, like strata of the social hierarchy they're going to end up in, have that person operate in that veil of ignorance, design the system because they'll do it in such a fair way because they don't know they could end up on the bottom of it. Um, And he posited that from that moral framework, the ideal moral system that would come out of it looked pretty socialistic with a universal basic income and uh, the rich making sure that the, there's a basic level of needs that are met. Um, The problem with this though, is that like, even in a situation where you design something like that, let's just grant that you could get some elites in there that were going to design the system and had ultimate power and capability uh, to make it possible, um, and they operate under this veil of ignorance, you still have people that end up within the distribution that are going to want to improve their situation. Like You're never going to be able to get rid of that. So even if you have someone that is elite and has the best of intentions, the people that end up somewhere in that hierarchy are not going to be content to stay there. And so you're still left with human action. How are they going to improve their situation? Because it's inevitable that humans want to improve their situation. If the only incentives they have to improve their situation, or the only mechanism, I should say, are incentives that are coercive and not natural and that are not actually producing a value, but more producing of like who knows who and how they can force other people to do what they want and and they can take stuff from people, then you're going to have a really collapsible society that resembles the Soviet Union or Mao's China. Um, And we've seen that occur. Like it's an historical fact that when you have a society that um, aspires to be this way, it inevitably leads to this because even if you have the best person at the top, you can't beat human nature. You can't beat human incentives or action. Um, And capitalism is the complete opposite, right? Even under the worst case scenario, we've got a bad actor. Like, uh, let's think of like, uh, what's his name? I can't remember the guy that like made the AIDS medication like fourteen hundred dollars or whatever, um, because it was a really like niche like market for this AIDS medication. Like only like a thousand people in the United States needed it, and so he made it really expensive. But it's like, well, you know, if if he didn't have a profit motive, no one would ever make the AIDS medicine. They just say, well, those thousand people need to die basically, because there's no way to actually produce enough resources for that um, under this operating principle that oh, all medicine should be free or all medicine should be you know, within affordability, it's like, well, no, there are certain things that cost something and you have to make people, even though of the worst character, uh, capitalism makes us of the worst people, the worst character still want to provide something that's good for people. And the only way that they can sustain themselves is providing good for people. That doesn't mean it's always the case for all time, but bad actors are, are, are cleared out and good actors remain atop. Yeah. It, it's funny because, uh, I feel like when you when you break down individual pieces of capitalist systems like that you can you can come to the conclusion that you do that uh, of sort of the benefits of free markets but in the abstract if you're if his argument is that you know oh people are less 
likely to come to the conclusion that that is, you know, what sort of this perfect society is. And, and in doing so, you you come to this realization that socialism is sort of an idyllic society. That the, the reason why is because socialism, by its very nature, involves pre-planning and controlling things. And it's a false assumption, right? In the same way that you or I wouldn't make the claim that, like, capitalism will always solve every single problem. Mm -hmm. I think we would make the claim that capitalism and free markets have the best chance to provide the most opportunity for the most people to have the incentives to do those things and where people's incentives lie is where they naturally will want to go but we also recognize that human nature is such that people have competing motives and competing opportunity costs and all those kinds of things so you know our claim isn't to say capitalism is a, is a perfect world with no drawbacks and no flaws whatsoever it is to recognize, though, that if you are to create the conditions for which a lot of these societal problems are solved, you need to do it in a free market way. And so the problem is, you know, the the assumption of, of socialism, it, when you're thinking about it in your mind, is, oh, well, then people will do this and governments will make people do this. And, you know, it will all just kind of happen because it's a controlling nature. But the problem is when you control things and, and people, they don't come out to your your uh you know the, the greatest laid plans of mice and men as it were you know you you can't you don't know what everyone's individual motives are what they're uh you know what what they what drives them what makes them tick what makes them go how you know, there are millions of unintended consequences of actions so that even if you try to design the perfect society through socialist means in your head you've already answered it you've already said this is what will happen but in the real world when you start part of your plan step a doesn't necessarily lead to step b and so um that to me is is one of the greatest flaws of this is to say well of course in your you know presupposed world you're going to you're going to come to the conclusion that a society run in the way that you're thinking about it in your head would work is the better way sure but that's not how life operates and so it's not as intuitive necessarily to recognize that you know a, a free society with choices and with um you know non-coerced behavior from people that those actually provide the most opportunity for people to solve problems uh, because that re requires you to understand other people's intuitions and other people's perspectives which is hard to do so it's so to me it's like yeah okay if you're if your entire argument is that like if you're starting from scratch and you're imagining an ideal society, well, sure, you might come to come to something of socialism. The problem is that that's not that's because you're you're sort of answering what a per perfect society is going to be like. Um, you know, my in my head, coming to a perfect society is all of the benefits of a socialist system done freely and and affordably in a capitalist system. So you know, it's I don't know. You can you can imagine all the things you want. You can answer for all the problems in your head as much as you wish, but just because one seems like it's intuitive I, I mean that's like saying oh my third you know my five-year-old kid can understand that why can't you and it's like well maybe because life is sometimes a little bit more complicated than what a you know someone who's imagining an ideal society uh thinks will will happen i don't know that that seems like a lacking kind of argument to me and there's also just a breakdown between like i, I mean uh, i like one of our favorites scott horton says this all the time that socialism works great for about 10 people and about 10 people only from scaling up from the household all the way to you know 500 million people in china uh the top 10 people in china do pretty well and then the top you know then the 10 people in a family usually do pretty well because a, a family household more or less is like to each according to his need and from each according to his ability i got that backwards but you know what i'm saying yeah, yeah. <laughs> um and uh but that's like that that works in the household because there's like a moral framework and goal and a cohesiveness of of um um of of purpose within a household which is like hey we exist to make us all thrive and be happy and to flourish um but the set that breaks down the second you have any significant producer or consumer that breaks from that purpose and no longer can't wants to be a part of it and no longer can be enforced to be a part of it or should be enforced to be a part of it i think most people recognize that parents over children uh, have the ability and the right to enforce various rules for the good of their household. I think most people realize that like, oh, you know, how I run my household, I shouldn't go enforce that upon my neighbor and say, hey, you know, you got to eat 10 carrots, you know, every every day for dinner or anything like that. Um, that's a weird example. But you know what I'm saying? Like, it's not my duty. It's not my right to go over and enforce how another household lives. My uh, My duty kind of, that's where it ends. 
Um, and so, but the second you have differing opinions and differing goals and differing actions and incentives, like that whole model breaks down. And so it only really works at that fam familial level. And it's morally okay at that level because everyone was within their rights. What socialism does is it extends that right to everyone. Now, suddenly you are your neighbor's keeper. You are responsible for that person on the other side of the country. Florida is responsible for Washington state and Washington state is responsible for Florida. Um, and whoever has the most power uh, can enact that upon them for good or for worse. And that might be okay if everyone is infinitely wise and infinitely virtuous. But the second no one, someone is not that way, an actor in that relationship is not that way, it's going to fall apart and it's going to be wrong and bad. Um, and that's what, what a lot of the, you know, Rawls has a pretty, seems like sophisticated um, take on all of this. And it's like he at least tries to lay out a moral framework as, a bo as opposed to just saying like, oh, it's self-evident. Uh, yeah. That we should take care of 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 the poor and the needy uh, through government means. You and I would both agree we're supposed to take care of the poor and the needy voluntarily. But uh, you know, he 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 tries to make the case that you can't because you are trying to work on the behalf of someone who has nothing. Uh, it is not a trampling of individual rights because the individual is getting something more. But what he forgets to, or maybe chooses to omit, is that. It does. It, it, he's working for the consumer, but there's also producers who are working more for less, and that is also a negative. That is injustice in and of itself, too. Um, so the only way to, you know, ha there's going to be inequality in society. It, it, if people have choice and they have the ability to do what they want to do, some people are going to make choices that, from one person's perspective, is going to result in them having less or more uh, than someone else. And that doesn't mean that something is wrong. It just means that people are free to do that. There are some cases where that's wrong, but it's usually when someone is enacting their their cohesive force on someone else. Yeah, that's absolutely right. I I don't think I have any more to add. So we'll All move right. to the next take here. This one's a long one from Scott Adams, and uh, he is discussing candidate Vivek Ramaswamy. So he says, when discussing Vivek Ramaswamy, I'm hearing smart people say that they want a president with past government experience. I have some questions. One, how is that working out so far? Two, which major changes in, uh, in our world were created by people with prior experience? Apple, SpaceX, Google. Three, why does collecting a paycheck for one government job make you qualified for a government job with different duties? Four. Who is more likely corrupt, an outsider or a career politician? Five, who is more likely to drive big changes we need, an entrepreneur or a career politician? Six, who is more bribable, a career politician or a wealthy outsider? Seven, who is more likely to feed the military industrial beast, an outsider or a career politician? Number eight, how long does it take someone like Vivek to learn everything a president needs to know about a complicated topic? A day? Check your assumptions. <laughs> okay, so there's a lot here. So let me know what what are you wanting to take on here? What you, what's in your wheelhouse? Uh, I'll I'll go backwards. So I'll start at number eight, uh, which is how long does it take someone like Vivek to learn everything a president needs to know about a complicated topic? Like that's such an interesting <laughs> like question because it assumes that uh, that we have a we have a standard for what is a presidential level of knowledge about a situation to, to be solved or a, a presidential level of knowledge about a complicated topic it's like yeah they basically all presidents have never been very smart they've only been charismatic in some way and won a popularity contest i mean one of the even though from in my opinion trump has been one of the best presidents of my lifetime and i say that giving him maybe a d plus c minus um like he definitely never picked up a book or read anything. I, I don't right. have you watched Dave Smith's uh, comic special. Yeah, yeah, yeah he's yeah, got yeah. a hilarious bit in there about like, he's like, yeah, even if Donald Trump is, you know, secretly Hitler and he has Mein Kampf sitting on his shelf, like, do you think he read it? Because he doesn't read books, <laughs> you know? And it's like, yeah. And, and what I loved about Trump is that he revealed and made it so obvious how all of the other past presidents, you know, all the stuff that the the liberals and the 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 never Trumper Republicans would get on about. Oh, oh, he he's not a good politician. He doesn't know anything about foreign policy. He has knows nothing about this, and he's just is kind of like saying all this rhetoric and making it appear like he knows things. It's like, yeah, that's how basically every president of the past 30, 50, 60, 80, 100 years has been. Uh, they've only ever tried to dodge questions. They've only ever tried to make it appear like they have things under control. And it's all just a smoke show of passing blame and trying to make it towards the next election cycle and get your votes. So 
you know, the 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 thought that like uh uh Vivek, who has actual world experience, has actually produced things where his job and his position has necessitated that he learn and know things is completely just opposed to a politician whose job is not to actually know things. You can succeed at being a politician and not know anything. You just need to be somewhat charismatic and be able to lie and do some unscrupulous things. Now, I will say the intelligence of the past presidents wouldn't be in question if we had uh, President Buttigieg right now with his voluminous mind. Um, oh, yes, that. yes, yes. <laughs> the cathedral of his brain. And yeah, because uh, yeah. <laughs> he, yeah. he also studies like religion from the past or something. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah. And, and I think that it's funny because um, people made the same argument uh, against Trump because yeah. he was an outsider and stuff. But but it's it's funny because either one you love Trump and so the, that argument doesn't really apply right because your your best argument is oh well Trump now has four years of experience but obviously you know if if that was your perspective you thought that the first time Trump was worthy enough without the four years so there's obviously you know qualities that matter more than that or second you hate Trump and thought think he's incompetent. But even those people have to recognize that there is a vast difference between Donald Trump and Vivek Ramaswamy in terms of the kinds of intelligent they are. Like, at best, you can argue that Trump is very uh, intelligent when it comes to being able to read rooms and, like, um, uh, manipulate people's emotions and, and charisma and those kinds of that kind of intelligence for sure. But, um, I mean, like, everyone has to acknowledge that even if you think Vivek is a is a phony, even if you think he's just sort of a talking head, he, he definitely has a level of like he has an ability to at least on the surface level have a, a a grasp of issues in a much deeper way than Trump. So there's at least you have to at least recognize that there's there's that question and you do have to sort of weigh that difference. But I would also say to this point specifically to add like look at the look at the quote unquote experts in in any region, like not even just presidents. Like look at the foreign policy apparatus and and their levels of success and you know, oh man, well that you know, this foreign uh foreign affairs experts studied his whole life on this issue and when it's left us with you know crumbling empires abroad and yep. you know a lot of taxpayer dollars on the hook so i don't think that like having a presidential knowledge level or even an administrative knowledge level is necessarily a, a good thing in that regard right um i want to i want to go to question three real quick unless you had any more on on no, number eight. Before. Okay. So, so number three, it, this one always makes me laugh because I remember even when I was young and too young to be red pilled, you know, <laughs> I was like young and, and, and sort of bought into this. I always remember listening to the different political primaries and, and thinking to myself, well, it's so weird how they keep reversing these arguments. What would happen? So the, the question three is why does collecting a paycheck for one government job make you qualified for a government job with different duties? And the way that this always came up in my head as a as a young child was in these primary debates you'd have like a sitting governor running against like a senator or a representative or you know th those are usually kind of the, the the roles that that apply sometimes people outside do but and the the arguments would be well he's a governor he doesn't have foreign policy experience and then the the, the retort back is oh they're just a, a senator they can talk about things but they haven't actually done things as a governor i've actually done things yes and it made me laugh. And I, I was, I mean, as a kid, at first I was confused because I was like, well, well, which one's more important? And then <laughs> realize that even if let's, let's, for the sake of argument, assume that these are good qualities to have, and they just <laughs> are necessarily beneficial, that even if you are an elected official, you have to weigh those things qualitatively. You can't just say, oh, he's been elected. Therefore, I want him as president. You have to recognize, oh, there are things in this job that give you experience and it's those things that are beneficial the the experience that rather than just having that title or necessarily being a governor and so similarly you have to recognize okay so sure ron ron DeSantis, let's say this is going against ron DeSantis. like ron DeSantis is governor who's gotten things done do we think that running a large company in the way that vivek has done do we think that there is a substantive, substantial difference in terms of the positive qualities you would need in order to operate in a government environment? Like, you, sure, Governor DeSantis might have familiarity with some of the bureaucratic processes, but that to me doesn't seem like it's a large hurdle to overcome for someone who's used to, again, implementing new strategies. It's kind of, you know, it's kind of like saying, well, should Ford 
hire a new CEO from internally or externally. And sure, internally has benefits, but oftentimes large companies like Ford specifically will hire outside their company when they hired like Alan Mulale to turn their entire fortunes around because they needed someone who was good at the skills that needed to be brought in and wasn't familiar with the culture. So all of all of my blathering here to say when they're when the question is, you know, why does collecting a paycheck from one government job make you qualified for a different government job? I would take it a step further and say, you know, why does having a government job, why is the familiarity of working within a government apparatus, why is that quality so much more valuable than any of the other skills and things you would learn in any other context. I would say that you don't have to be a foreign ambassador to be really good at quote unquote foreign policy experience. If you're very studied up, if you've interacted with the cultures a lot, if you've read about people, you've interacted with them, you you've learned about their governments and you just have never held the job, you're probably very qualified for an ambassadorship, uh, you know, in terms of on paper uh skills even if you didn't have that title. So it, it's a very shallow and sort of a shortcut to try to disqualify someone to say, oh, they just don't have elected official experience. Yeah. It, what's always so funny to me, and I've talked about this before on the show, is that these guys and gals, because Nikki Haley's up there, will want to have it both ways, where they want to be attacking the status quo of, wow, oh my goodness, like how terrible this has been. It's been terrible for years, and it's time that we end this. Time to have a morning in America moment again. You know, and and then then they will within the same breath turn around and say, Vivek, like your 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 lack of policy and international experience, it <laughs> it it shows, you know, it's like it's like, man, you can't you can't have it both ways. You know, you've you've either been a part of this beast or you're not a part of this beast. And if you've been a part of this beast, then you need to at least own up to the responsibility um, of the outcomes that you've driven. And it's shown by the fact that like basically every year, a majority of Americans think that we're not on the right track, that uh, Congress is not doing a good job, that our government officials basically all suck. And so it's very popular for these people to like try and position themselves and pretend like they're not a part of this. You know, Joe Biden, who's been in, in the government for 50 years. Oh, no, like there's so many systemic, awful things that are in the government. It needs to be fixed and pretend that he simultaneously, you know, can hate on Trump for being inexperienced. It's like, man, you, one, one, this, these are actually exclusive. Like you cannot hold one without holding the other uh, or while holding the other, because it, it's either that you have been a part of the systemic problem this entire time or like you've got to defend it and no one is going to defend it because that's not very cool or sexy to do. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Um, a lot of these other questions I think are, yeah. are fairly, you know, tautological in a sense, like yeah. he's, he's begging the question a little yeah. bit, uh, you know, who's, who's more likely to uh, feed the military industrial beast an outsider or a career politician. I, I think we know the answer know. there. And Nikki Haley. let's be honest, <laughs> if you work for Lockheed Martin, like maybe, maybe it's a, a an actual question, but, uh, yeah, for for anyone else, it's it's pretty yeah. obvious. I, I will say the other the other thing that does make me laugh, how you're how, sort of akin to your point about you know them complaining about the status quo and then saying you weren't part of the status quo. I also laugh even if you're talking about. Um, I think I think maybe the the best argument you could make for someone be having prior elected experience is specifically being elected, right? Saying like this person knows how to run a campaign sure. and to be charismatic and electable. And for that argument. It makes sense, but it also does make me laugh when, for instance, Chris Christie makes his pitch about I was a Republican. Well, he says conservative, but no, he would never. No, no, he was no. conservative. Uh, I was a Republican governor in a blue state and won by sixty percent. And then I can't remember who it was. If it was a moderator or someone else, pointed out that like by the end of your term, you had like an eight percent approval rating. Yeah. <laughs> so That's funny. and so that just to me kind of speaks to your point where it's like it's very easy to. To say, oh, I'm an outsider, or I, you know, I've, I, I, I'll take these on, um, but I also have the experience. And then once you've shown, yeah, your experience was extremely unpopular, or <laughs> your, your experience was extremely bad, and, and the, the legacy you left was terrible. So, uh, yeah, I, just because someone's an outsider doesn't make them good, but just because they're elected, it, it, you should be even more skeptical of them. But they have a track record you might be able to, to follow a little bit closely if you want to. So, okay. Our next post uh, is a quote from Joe Walsh, uh -huh. our favorite guest on this show who who should make an appearance at some point. <laughs> he we goes, should invite him. Yes, be funny. Should. Just do great. all Joe Walsh takes. Like, do you think this is good, Joe? <laughs> yeah, well, we'll go back and forth with him. I'm sure he'd be down for it. That's what he does on his show. You know, he yeah. might be. Yeah, we could keep. We could have like. I think he's had one or two good ones on our show before. Yeah, 
Yeah, yeah that's true. All right. So he tweets, or well, he says, and, and this picture was tweeted. Yep, I'll admit it. Joe Biden is old. But Donald Trump is deranged. He's cruel. He's dishonest. He's malignantly narcissistic. He's disloyal to country. He's cultish. He's ignorant. He's authoritarian. He's corrupt. He's lawless. I'll take old over all that bad in a heartbeat. Uh, what do you make of this tweet? When, when, do you know when this quote was taken? It's I'm unforgivable guessing... any time, but it gets worse the, the, the closer it is to our current date. Yeah, I don't know. The tweet that had this posted was recent, but I don't know when the quote was because I think the quote is older than the, you know this the tweet of this image. I mean, I, it, I think it, this is probably an older quote. Regardless, like everyone, Joe Biden has been a liar at you know within the past forty years. It's been known he's a liar and he plagiarizes things and uh, he's dishonest. So it's like it's it's always this weird projection. And that's one of the things I love about Donald Trump is he he probably is deranged in some way. He is cruel. He is dishonest. He is narcissistic. It's like, yeah, that's kind of like par for the course for all politicians. And so they just they can't stand that he makes it obvious that, oh, yeah, anyone that wants aspires to be part of this elite system that controls your life from halfway across the country. Uh, yeah, they are going to be probably awful. You know, Tolkien writes about that. You know, ruling other men is the least suitable job for anyone uh, and, you know, much less people that aspire to have that control of, over other men. So, you know, Joe Biden's, uh, like I was saying, his dishonesty when he was running for president back in the 80s and 90s, uh, back when, uh, you know, he just as recently when he was VP and he was helping his son Hunter, which has now been basically proven, uh, facilitate all these business deals and get on the boards of, uh, of, of uh, Burisma and and make a bunch of money and fuel his crack cocaine addiction. It's like, yeah, he he is the definition of a slimy, fake, authoritarian, and ignorant politician who doesn't know anything and just kind of moves with the times. He doesn't actually have any principles other than what benefits him uh, and makes him feel good and feel awful and feeds his ego. And so that could be true of Donald Trump. It's probably a little bit less so because Donald Trump is incentivized in a different way. Then Joe Biden, Joe Biden's literally been a career politician his entire life. And so his incentives completely line up with those qualities. Uh, Donald Trump probably character lines up with those qualities, but he's actually had to produce things in some way or form or fashion. And maybe it's not all good. I'd say, you know, I'm not a big fan of a lot of his business dealings and, and the industries he's in, but at least he's produced something. You know, Joe Biden's only taken things. So I, I have to admit, I think I've baited you a little bit because I'm categorizing this take as accidentally accidentally based. I um, well, love the to hear reason, it. The reason why is for the very last line. I'll take old over all that in a heartbeat. Because if you look at Trump and and you sort of assume, okay, he's all these things, and then as you rightfully point out, so is Joe Biden. Then yeah, I'd rather have a completely inept. That's fair. Old that's old you're old. that's told you're you have baited me, and you that is fair. <laughs> Of course, the only reason why I can say that this is based is because of all of the reasoning that you laid out. I think I think where this take is bad and cringe and, and actually is bad is assuming that the only character flaw of Joe Biden is that he's old, right? That is the yes. that is the sort of burying <laughs> your head in the sand moment. And you know, it it makes me think about um and everyone's going to groan if they're not a fan of this of but I'm sure you're going to eat this up too uh, which is Star Wars. It makes me think of the the new sequel series and the, my biggest complaints and the things I've I've ra railed on about the problem with the character Rey, the protagonist, and they do this in all modern Disney Marvel things. When they want to have a character with a flaw or a weakness, but they don't actually really want to give them a flaw or a weakness, they always give them memory loss or some kind of I can't remember my full power. And then the, the turning moment is they gain it back. And that's the big turning point versus something where like it was Tony there all Stark. along. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Versus something like Tony Stark, who, are, who is Iron Man, where he's very arrogant. He's very selfish. And then he has to overcome that weakness and, and do self-sacrificial things. And that's the growth that's genuine and, and good. And so to me, this is the exact same thing where it's like, oh, Joe Biden. Yeah, he has problems. He's old. Like, that's the only thing, the only critique he's taking out when 
yeah, there are a lot of especially sort of boomer Republican memes or just conservatives, younger conservatives, like a Charlie Kirk or something, making fun of Biden for being old and doddering and stuttering. And yeah, that's fair. I think it's fair to to make fun of people like that when they're elected into office and like they shouldn't be there, quote unquote. But um, but then leaving it at that and not taking any of the other complaints, right? Not taking the 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 corruption, not taking his his awful drug policies that you know sent so many people to prison over very little and in very uh you know unequal distribution um his his corrupt scandals his i mean his bad policies just in general uh, on the economy like yes donald trump signed one of the biggest spending packages and he you know crucified yes. massey for for holding it up but then biden has also signed an even bigger spending package so so yes like th- they, they both have these terrible qualities. Um, so the good part of that is, yeah, I, I mean, like, it's kind of like looking at, like, yeah, I'd rather John Fetterman, you know, not be doing anything because he's checked into a hospital than voting us into another w- war. Not that not that we voted into war, to be fair, but voting for money that would go to, to you know, sure. supplying arms for another war. Um, and frankly, I, I, you know, I'm happy probably the moments when... <laughs> Mitch McConnell has been quiet on the podium, just standing there silently and everyone's confused. That's probably some of the best 30 seconds in his career as far as the harm he's done the country. So in that sense, I'll take, I'll take old over a bad, uh, over those bad things. But the reality is they're pretty much all that bad. And they're pretty much all um, doing the kinds of things that Donald Trump was upfront about. And so, you know, yeah, Donald Trump sort of played his hand visibly for everyone but he only really pulled back the curtain if you don't think that there's narcissism at least in 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 some degree of every president we've ever had and of most sitting elected officials i don't think you've ever been to washington dc and met these people because you can almost taste it in the air when you walk into a room with some elected officials and this goes all the way down to state governments too and it's not it's not a it's not heartening for those of us who who have this ideal that if we're going to have a government in place at least we're electing everyday people who care about the country you get a sense really quickly that they're full of themselves and they care a lot more about maintaining their own position than than uh, the country's benefit yeah and i think that's like the one silver lining of trump as i've alluded to before is that i, I saw this clip of him in the base with jeb bush and i i remember certain moments but like it was just wonderful and delicious to see it all over again you know jeb bush talking with him and saying like oh yeah you you it's really it's a tough job and uh and trump's like oh yeah jeb you're you're a tough guy jeb <laughs> you know and it's just like <laughs> yeah. jeb's trying to slam back at him and trump's oh. just like yeah jeb like you know at the beginning of the campaign you were over here with me and you keep moving three feet over to the left and eventually you're going to be off the stage. And obviously he says it in the only way that Trump can say it. But I love that his like, it's kind of like the meme of um the, uh, I don't know if you watch Thor Ragnarok or not, but like there's the meme of like, it's like, oh yeah, I can't beat you, but he can. Yeah. And it's yeah. like, yeah, it's a bad guy, but it's like, you know, Trump is a bad guy. Trump has nasty qualities, but at least he's like going to kill everyone in his vicinity. And so as long as I keep him away from me, and he stays near all these politicians, like at least we'll get a little bit of fun and those guys get, uh, you know, get taken off their high horse. I mean, it was just what a wonderful thing to see him destroy a Bush and a Clinton in the same year. Like just incredible. Yeah. Well, and the last thing, the last thing I'll say before we move on is the one that sticks out to me is uh, he's authoritarian. Now, I haven't gone through all of Joe Walsh's takes on Trump. But the vast majority of people who complain about Trump being authoritarian never complain about the authoritarian things he does and only complain about the libertarian-ish things yeah. he did. The, the The class was upset at him for taking his stances against the Iraq war. They praised him when he dropped the bomb in Syria. They praised him when he appointed people like John Bolton to his you know, cause. And he complained when he tried to talk down the generals on anything, you know? So for as much as people complain about all these things about Trump, like, oh, well, he was authoritarian. Yeah, there are good things to complain about Trump on where he was. Sure. But 99% of the time, that's not what people are actually complaining about. And so these kinds of critiques ring a little hollow. Yep. Okay. Our next take uh, is 
so it, it's Christopher Rufo talking about an excerpt of a Time Magazine article that um, is discussing him and some of his viewpoints. So the Time Magazine article reads, Rufo has said that universities exist to promote the true, the good, and the beautiful. But he ignores that some people think gender studies and DEI are true, good, and beautiful. In a free society, we let people make their own choices about what they value, and our universities, steeped in traditions of academic freedom and scholarly rigor, <laughs> embrace and debate a multiplicity of viewpoints and disciplines. <laughs> um, and Chris Rufo tweets, yes, and the people of Florida made the free choice to elect Governor Ron DeSantis, who appointed a Senate-confirmed board of trustees who made the free choice to abolish academic and administrative programs that did not meet the new minimum standard. This is democracy in action. He continues, left liberals appeal to, quote unquote, our democracy only when it advances their hegemony. When it does not, they're utterly baffled and through their confusion, convince themselves that democratic choices are a violation of some other abstract concept. The grasping is the tell. All right. So I think we're going to critique probably the lower thing, but we can dig into the, all yeah. of it if you want. Uh, what are your initial thoughts? Uh, he's right. Um, I, I He's Rufo's a Republican. He is. Right? Yeah. I mean, that's he, kind of the vibe I get from him. He's it, kind of, yeah, he's kind of a, a red pill Republican. Red pill Republican. Yeah. So he's right. Like, I mean, that's, I, I really appreciate how he laid it out because the, the, the hilarious bit in the, uh, is it, you said it was time magazine article. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, is the, you know, universities are steeped in traditions and they embrace scholarly rigor and embrace debate on a multiplicity of viewpoints and disciplines, except anything that is outside of, you know, this orthodoxy that they, they've chosen to uh, uh, adopt. Um, and I mean, you, this is kind of a, a little bit rabbit trail, but like you see the chaos that unfolds when you don't have the ability to debate what is good and true and beautiful uh, and you make it relative to whatever anyone else thinks. Um, and that's, you know, b basically it reminds me of when Jack Dorsey and his lawyer were on Joe Rogan and they were arguing with Tim Pool. And Tim Pool is basically saying like, hey, look, like Twitter can do whatever it wants because it's a private company. But you guys do have a left wing bias and you are biased against conservatives. And they'll say, no, 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 we're not we're not biased at all. And then Tim Pool will go, well, no, you are because. Like, do you believe that men can be women or that women can be men, you know, and and, and biologically change their gender? And, uh, you know, Jack Dorsey and Vijaya God said, no, like, that's hate speech. If someone says that it's like, well, there you go. Like to to Republicans and conservatives, they believe this. And so it's like we have to be able to debate that. Twitter obviously made it so that you couldn't debate that or talk about that. And so that really illustrates that left liberals like in a private company or in uh, a public university or any space of education, it's like, oh no, like the majority, this is good for everyone. This is true, good and beautiful. But the second it doesn't adhere to what they want, it's no, no, that's hate speech. That's awful. That we shouldn't, a tolerant society should not tolerate those types of viewpoints. Um, so, you know, I, I don't know what Christopher Rufo's like views overall on how like this stuff should be solved, but I like his, uh, I like his perception and his, uh, the way he's laid out what the current situation is. Um, I don't know exactly like how he would propose to fix this problem. Um, it seems like he's very much in favor of, you know, the government being involved. And it's like, well, this works until someone that's not named Ron DeSantis comes in and becomes governor. I mean, maybe it's continued, but uh, it would just be best if, you know, individual universities and private businesses could make their own decisions on things. Yeah, I, I, I think that that's the, the ultimate key here, right? I think it's, you know, it's maybe unfair to think that of their own volition, these universities with, you know, if you just sort of had a, a government withdrawal would remove this kind of thing right away. But it's, it, you know, at least in the current moment to me, it, it, it seems a lot like libertarians in particular need to at least at least acknowledge that there's maybe another side to some of the government intervention stuff a little bit, like with this particular aspect yeah. in the same way that for instance, like we would say, okay, we don't like state government, but if the government's going to legalize freedom, that would be a good thing, right? right? Like during the COVID lockdowns, if the government, if the governor of a state says, I'm going to make a law where you actually can't force, you know, business businesses can't force people to wear a mask and be vaccinated. 
Like that wouldn't be our ideal solution, right? But we also would recognize that the sit the situation you're in is you're getting fed propaganda, you're getting fed with these federal lockdown mandates in so many ways. And so it's not really a fair playing ground because the government has been enforcing this one-sided propaganda. And I think that that's where we are currently in many ways with DEI and gender studies and things like that, where if this all just was a cultural thing and the government had no sway and no, no part of it, that'd be one thing. But we recognize that the government not only has wholeheartedly embraced these ideas and pushed them on kids, but they've also made it so many in so many areas in particular of universities requirements like you have to have your board be 50 percent you know this way 50 percent that way you know 50 percent men women or x percent number of of quote-unquote oppressed peoples and things like that and so from that perspective you know i'm not necessarily a fan of the idea of the government telling a university like you can't teach this thing but insofar as the government is in control of a university. You have a government that historically has been pushing these ideas that are, in essence, racist. Then I'm not necessarily going to cry too many tears when the government says, actually, no, you can't teach things that are inherently telling some people that they are better or worse than others because that's not really uh, equal access uh, and treating people equally as as our law should require based on the tenets of the the and de declaration of independence and things sure. like that. So to me, it's like, this is maybe the least evil of, of an evil, if you're going to consider it that. And so that's to me it's why fair. this, this time magazine take is so disingenuous. It's acting like, Oh, but in a free society, we teach everything. It's like, yeah, you wouldn't in a moment tolerate a, a the, <laughs> the university uh, teaching something like white, uh, supremacy history right like like a, a, not even not even white supremacy in the in the sort of traditional sense but like so you know like achievements of white people through history do you think time magazine would be saying no some people think that white history is true and good and beautiful so they should be allowed to teach a class on the triumphs of specifically white straight males you know like we know that the veil is so far gone that it's not a matter of what about ism here it's like we're just preempting that step you know yeah. because so so long the problems with with conservatives is they would try to make that class the, the the board would disallow it and then they would point and say but what about these things and what about what about but it would all be retroactive and so at this point you know DeSantis and and Rufo's is promoting is saying no we actually went ahead and just preempted you because we know it would happen if we tried to teach that you would say it's not allowed and so we're just going to stop you right now so again for better or for worse it's a much more proactive thing and i think ultimately down the road if, if it keeps capitulating that way you are going to go into sort of the the overcorrection territory i think you're right the government can't solve this problem and i think we do need a decoupling but in the meantime you have to stop the swing in one direction with you paid kind of for work. it you might as well get what you paid for exactly and, and yeah. so it's like you know it's like we do complain about the pendulum swinging the other direction and that's fair but right now, the pendulum is still swinging this way, and you need yeah. some kind of force to stop it. Yeah. And if this is the, the quickest path with the least resistance, I'm not going to complain that much about it. Yeah. Yep. I don't have any more to add on that one. Okay, great. We'll move on to, uh, I think this is our last one. So we are, <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. So this is actually a whole thread of tweets, and I only picked one because I just wanted to talk about this one kind of perspective. But there's like a whole lot, and we could probably spend a whole episode or more dedicated to each of these sort of complaints and objections but regardless we'll just tackle this for now <laughs> and maybe we can come back later if we if we feel like dipping our toes into the school choice debate some more yeah. so this tweet reads let's take a minute and imagine an alabama where there are no public schools every child gets a voucher worth 10k to pay for whatever school they want and anyone can open a school no regulations just like republicans like what would happen a thread Lots of shysty characters would open schools looking to make a buck. How would parents be able to tell which were trustworthy and which were not? Without regulation, there's no guarantee the teachers are qualified, nor that the school produces any actual education. All right, that's the first of many complaints, but but this one struck me particularly. How does it strike you, Brett? Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's really funny. I'll have to go read through the whole um, the whole thread because I'm interested to see her other other uh, reasons and what and and scenarios that would happen um but let's just imagine for a second that there are these boxes and 
you have to hop into this box to go anywhere and this box can go up to 200 miles per hour and it's got lots of moving parts in it that can fail and so you have to have people that can fix it it's like okay that sounds like a really important aspect of life it's like well how would we ever let the free market you know handle cars you know with with repairing and maintenance of these cars like how would anyone you know anyone can open a mechanic shop without any regulation how are consumers going to know which mechanics are good and which mechanics are bad and you know how are they going to know where they're going to best spend their money it's like well we have those today right like people are able to figure out mechanics we've got a great mechanic just up the road i heard about them from a neighbor that i trusted uh you can also go on the internet and look at google so it's like people will selectively decide or selectively omit um, certain types of services that are very important, like how well your car runs and how safe it is and how well maintained it is, is really, really important. Like it, it literally a life or death type of scenario. If you have a brake job done on your car and it's not done well and you need to go stop when you're going 60 miles per hour and it doesn't stop, you're going to die most likely. And so we don't question that though, that there, we don't think, oh, well, there needs to be government run mechanics and government run repair shops and government run brake jobs uh, available for people. So how much more attention do you think parents are going to, uh, or they're going to spend when it comes to their kids? Yes, they're going to be bad actors. There are always bad act actors. There are bad actors today in the public school system that molest children. I mean, public schools have the worst rate of, of child assault and molestation uh, among any sort of like institution. Uh, it's literally almost 200 times more than, you know, Catholics, which you would think like because of all the media coverage, like Catholic schools and Catholic uh, parishes are like the worst thing in the world for children to go to. It's like, no, it's actually public school administrators that, that are the worst uh, 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 child predators out there. So it's like, yeah, there are bad actors. Fa schools do a bad job already. We have failing educational standards by their own metrics, they fail them. Um, and then they don't spend their money very well. And so it's like, yeah, like you're going to have bad actors as, as our, uh, as our previous guest, Larry Sharp said, you know, the dystopian future that you are so scared of is already here today. Exactly. Schools already suck with regulation. So the only thing that can happen without regulation is that people can now incentivize and reward good actors. There is currently no way to reward good actors in the public school system. Uh, the only way to reward actors is to send your kids to private school while also still paying your taxes to public school. That's exactly right. So you you talk, I, the first thing that struck me is this just is so insulting. How would parents be able to tell which were trustworthy and which were not? <laughs> As if like you don't have the capacity to judge if they're getting an education during the school year. The great thing is with normal products and services, if something isn't working, you can stop paying for it and go somewhere else. And so sure, you might have to pull your kid out after three months in the school year and find a different school. But here's the thing. You don't live in an, an, on an island. If you find your kid is not doing well, you're going to leave the review. You're going to tell your friends, your community. You're going to say, hey, which school has been working for you? Because this one was not. And you know what that does? That either one drives bad actors out of the market because no one's going to choose them. Or two, it makes poorly functioning but well-intentioned schools realize in order to get money, we need to up our quality and we need to up our, our output. And so, you know, let's say worst case scenario, for some reason, you're locked into a school for a year and your kid just gets super behind because they're just out to make a buck. Oh, wait a minute. That sounds an awful lot like what happened during the COVID lockdowns when parents had kids who were a year behind. They were forced. They had no choice. They had no way to, to move their uh, kid into a, a, to an alternate school that was open because the, the government was trying to shut every public school down and the, your only choice was to pay on top. So, you know, this is just a total, you know, uh, Saul Alinsky tactic. Blame them for what is happening for you. There's so many people who leave the public education system without real education. And that's what's happening now. And parents have no recourse. So, um, yeah. And, and the other thing is, of course, that parents, when you when you provide a situation where they have the active choice and, and the decision. It's not just assigned based on zip code, like your public school currently is. That makes parents more invested in that kind of decision because it's not just a default, oh, my kid will go here. They actually have to sort of look into what, what options do I have? Even the, even the prospect of looking up nearest school near me in this day and age means that you're probably using Google, you're probably doing a Google search. And if it's, 
you know, not a government entity, even if it is a government entity, there's probably a Google star review rating pulled up right next to it. And there are very few parents who I know who are going to, you know, just, oh, what's the nearest school me? See like a two star rated school and think, oh, that's fine. I'll send them there. <laughs> right. So there's always motive to prove. And, and, and to be fair, there are some parents who don't care, who would yeah. put their kid in a failing school. And that's the situation we have now. Those parents also aren't helping their children in schools that are sucking. And the worst part is there are many parents who do care about their kids who can't move their kids out of those schools. So at, you know, under a free system, where you have the ability to move at best, you enable the parents who do care to take their kids out of bad situations into good ones where currently they're trapped. And at worst, you let parents who are not caring for their for their children stay in bad schools where they currently already are in the status quo. Of course, I have other problems with this, a lot of presumptions that go into some of our further takes. Like, let's just say there were no public schools. To me, I'm like, end it. Don't even get, don't give more taxpayer money for, for this because some of her complaints are about like raising prices and things like that. And I'm like, yeah, that, that would sort of gouge the market. I could see that being a thing too. That's why you just eliminate the subsidy. And then there will be people, there will be charities, there will be, you know, institutions that arise that help scholarship for people who need it rather than just creating a, a free ride option for um, that, that degrades in quality, because even if you set up a, a charitable organization that distributes funds and scholarships for, for kids who are, uh, who can't afford an all private system, let's say, uh, guess what? Those schools still have to compete for that money. It's not a free ride like it is in the current public education yeah. system where it all rolls in to the same public school system that negotiates your tax dollars with legislators, not with you. And so even in that system where you have to set up, you know, massive charities, for or or you know societies to help scholarships for kids who can't afford it you're still going to get a level of competition from from lower end schools to try to improve their output uh relative to getting more money from from those students yeah and <laughs> like if you flip this around let's just say we have this reality where there are no public schools and someone's proposing it and i want to make the same version of her argument back to her uh, which is, well, let's just say there are public schools and there's only one single provider of education that is funded and everyone has to pay into it. Like, let's just say what would happen. It's like, oh, yeah, there would be you know, no choice for teachers to be able to migrate to different jobs with different pay because they're all governed by the same teachers union. There would be uh, and that would be OK in some instances, but it would also be very bad because really bad teachers would not be able to be fired. Uh, like you could have a teacher that could look at porn in the classroom and because his teacher's contract, the school that has the best of intentions to provide good quality education to their students couldn't fire him. And so they'd have to have him sit in the break room and get paid all of his money that he normally would, but he just couldn't teach. And it's like, yeah, is that a good use of money? It's like, oh yeah, well that actually happens today. Like those crazy scenarios that are absurd, that have no ability to be solved by the free market or by people using their money in a way that incentivizes good behavior. All that stuff exists today and it can't be fixed because it's so absurd. A lot of the problems that she talks about, they would exist. Like that happens anywhere that you have humans that have choice and money to, to spend and resources to allocate. The difference is, is that the system that we are advocating for will self-clean itself. Like good actors will remain, bad actors will be cleared out. In the current system, there is no mechanism for bad actors to be cleared out. Bad actors will stay and they will continue to stay and continue to be a leech on the system and draining money from people that never want to contribute to that system in the first place. Yeah. And, and the, my, my last chime in here is like, let's let's talk about teachers unions, because the teachers unions have all kinds of absurd requirements, like you point out, you know, sort of uh, for last in first out, you know, not merit based. And the great thing is, if you support teach right now, you have no choice. Basically, if you work in the public education system, you lose access to so many benefits by not joining this overly politicized teachers union that directly negotiates with legislators, not with people. OK, that you, you have very little choice. But but if you wanted to as a parent, you don't not, not every parent supports the decisions that these teachers unions make with the donations they make politically and yep. things. You could choose to go to a school that is no teachers union. That could be that would be an option for you. And guess what? Then teachers unions have to once again work to make themselves more palatable, to make themselves more trustworthy, to provide benefits without alienating people and without uh, or, or if they do alienate people, then make sure that you're sort of pitching to the right people and, and just, you know, getting uh, your your membership from those people and, and having students come into the school 
from people that you are specifically serving. And that's fine. The great thing about choice is it allows diversity. It's real diversity, not this sort of artificial diversity just based on skin color and, and other immutable characteristics, but diversity of opinion, of thought, of perspective, of how people want to live. And so if you don't approve, approve of, you know, what a teacher's union rules are, and so, you know, that teacher's union won't let the the teacher who's been working there for 40 years and is totally zoned out and not interested in actually doing anything innovative, they want to protect them and not fire them. That's great. I'm going to take my kid to a school where teachers are rewarded and and punished based on what they're doing and what their merit is. And that would be a totally free option. And I, I think it would improve unions. I think it would improve education for children. And it would improve uh, just the, the well-being of America, generally speaking, in terms of having a diversity of options and thought and perspectives. Yeah, I agree with you. All right. Well, thanks so much for tuning in. We appreciate you guys listening. If you enjoyed this, make sure to share, leave a comment, all that good stuff, and we'll catch you on the next one. Take care.